former cosmetologist, now stay-at-home mom, huge foreigner, uh, and I've known you uh, pretty much longer than I've been alive at this point. <laughs> Half, really over half of my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we've been talking about movies since the seventh grade. <laughs> Great. So I am Kame, and I am a part-time doing something. I don't know what this is I'm doing, but I do massage. I take care of my family. And I love to talk about horror, too. So that is why we are doing this podcast, because we love talk about horror and in preparation for the big release scream we are going to take it all the way back to scream one the very first scream the og the old like this movie set the standard for a lot of different films to come so tell us a little bit about your first memory of Scream. Oh, okay. So this is when it first came out and, you know, I grew up in a very strict household, you know this. Mm-hmm. So the only thing we got to do every weekend was go to like Blockbuster and Hollywood Video. And I remember my brother begged my dad because they were like, oh, we heard about it at school. Mm-hmm. It's something good. So we rented it and I re- just remember that opening scene. <laughs> Let me see, this is like 96, right? Mm-hmm. So I had like eight-ish. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like seven, eight-ish. And it was, it terrified me, but I just wanted to know, like, it It made me get into who done it. Yes, sure. yes. That was the core theme of where I started to be like, I love a who done it because they kept us on the ropes the whole movie about yeah. who the hell did it. Because we didn't know. <laughs> Everybody right. had a theory. So, yes, spoiler alert, this movie's over 20-some odd years old, so if you haven't seen it, I suggest you go check it out. I think it's still streaming on HBO Max or Paramount Plus. It's on something. It's on one of them. Right. So, quick synopsis is it is the year anniversary of our girl, Sydney Prescott, her mother was murdered the year prior. And now the town of Woodsboro is being plagued by someone calling residents, threatening them, and is going on an all out murder spree. And we have to spend the whole movie figuring out who is trying to kill Sydney. Mm-hmm. So, key players, key, key characters that really stuck out to you. What do you think, how do you think they did with the portrayal of Sydney and her mother? Because even though Sydney's mother was not in the whole movie at all, we never saw her. I feel like she was such a big reason of why a lot of things were happening. Yeah, she was definitely a, a central plot point and mm-hmm. a catalyst. And mm-hmm. the breadcrumbing of her throughout the movie, you learn a little bit more about Maureen Prescott and a little bit more about things that she was doing that kind of started all of this for Sydney. Um, quite frankly, I feel like, you know, I'm a, I'm, I love Wes Craven, R.I.P. Mm-hmm. Probably some of the best written characters front to back, start to finish, from the top to the bottom. I mean, we have Sydney, we have her best friend Tatum, we have the boyfriend Billy Loomis, we have the delicious Sue Mocker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we got horror nerd Randy Meeks. We got Deputy Dewey, which is Caitlin Spreader. We have Gail Weathers, who is our uh, reporter slash journalist. Um, we have Kenny, her cameraman, who is like one of my favorite characters. Oh yeah, he's so damn lovable. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Um, you've got Henry Winkler as principal. Yes. Which I feel like everybody forgets about Henry Winkler as the Safans was the principal. Right. Even the sheriff was funny. I just feel like. I love all of the characters for so many different reasons. And mm-hmm. I could never, I think about if you could change one. And you can't. They, they no. all fit. They all fit. So. They, I feel like the cast too, they played very well off of each other. They had very good on screen chemistry because you really thought that these kids were in their, they were in their teens and they were really friends. My favorite yeah. personal one 
was Randy. He was like the ideal of like, he was on to something. Like he was on to something. I, I, I love Sue. You know, I love a psychopathic white boy. I can't help it. Yes. Like <laughs> he was just so, he was so absurdly outrageous. Like, that was Matthew Lillard's movie. Like, I know that we love Sidney Hall, but he just, like, commanded that movie. He the did. The fans are still begging yes. to bring you back. Yes. Yes. And I never, I've never watched any interviews where he mentioned Scream, but he did such a fabulous job playing Stu. Not playing Stu, but, you know, he did such a, such a fabulous yeah. job. Just in that I, role, I, I, he I, took it serious. Like he really took it serious, and he, at the end, it was like, oh, he has lost his marbles, like for real. Yeah, I, I watched the panel, and I was trying to go to horror, um, horror hound in Cincinnati again, and he was going to be there last year, but the baby was so young mm-hmm. that we couldn't go. Mm-hmm. But I've watched so many screen panels where he talks about it, and he says like it was a make or break for everyone involved. Yes including Wes Craven because Wes had had so many failures before Scream mm-hmm. that if this didn't work out, he was going to quit directing. People don't know that either. People, right. a lot of people do not know that about Wes Craven that, you know, he's right now we know him from Scream and his previous work really had him questioning whether he was doing the right thing, this, like you said, this movie was make or break for a lot of actors and actresses. Uh, it was a lot of fresh faces, you know, it's a lot yeah. of people. This was their. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 You know, Matthew Lillard was trying to get bigger. Ned yes. Campbell was coming off the of party of five. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Rose McGowan was trying to get her foot in the door. No one had even really heard of Jamie Kennedy like that. Right. Right. David R. I mean, the, the, the Three most notable people in that whole movie, outside of Henry Winkler, of course, would be um, Courtney Cox from Friends. It was a big deal for her trying to get into movies. Mm-hmm. David Arquette is from a huge Hollywood family, but mm-hmm. he was having trouble. Yep. And then, um, who else was I thinking about? That was a really big name. Oh, Drew Barrymore, of course. Yes. And that, that was after she had done her stint in rehab. So she was trying to get, like, it right. was a big deal for everybody. It was. And fun fact is Drew Barrymore actually auditioned for Sydney. Really? Yes. Never knew that. Yes. How do you think that would have changed the movie if, if I, Drew Barrymore... I don't, think, I, I don't think it would have been as good. I don't. No. And she said herself that once she like reread it, she was like, no, I want to be Casey because I think it'd be a good idea. Mm-hmm. And, and even though she obviously died in the opening scene, that opening scene in itself was iconic because it it really it really fucked a lot of us up <laughs> as kids as 90s okay. kids watching yeah, let's that just, let's just jump right into that so you Boom. hear like you hear the phone ring mm-hmm. like this off rip mm-hmm. and you know it's not going to be good because it's a horror movie like we like by this point we've seen enough phone call horror movie situations mm-hmm but can we ever just talk about how, like, the actual voice of, of like, Ghostface was, like, just so seductive on the phone? Like, I would have talked to him, too, in the 90s. Yes. This is, like, the 90s, 90s. Like, yes. right before Caller ID. So, yes. like, <laughs> I would have been like, hey, like, yeah, what's up? Mm-hmm. And it's just so cute and playful, and he's flirting. And she's like, yeah, I'm just, you know, watching a scary movie, and I'm going to make my popcorn, and my boyfriend's coming over. And, you know, she's like, okay, well, good luck. And then, like, they call back. Mm-hmm. And that's where, as a viewer, we get a little bit deeper because we anticipate something is happening. Something's going to happen. Where is this going? And I feel yes. like that's how they kept us on the ropes during this movie where they we didn't know what was going to happen. Now, here's the crazy part. I rewatched this movie. Mm-hmm. And there's a part in the opening scene that I had never noticed until like two days ago. If you go back to that opening scene with the outside of the house, mm-hmm. the swing that they hang her from eventually is moving. Oh. So someone was sitting there before we go into the house. It was, it's moving. Oh, okay. I never and even it, noticed that. And I watched this like a few weeks ago. And it made it even creepier thinking they were sitting on her damn swing. Yeah. Talking to her. Watching, yeah, watching her the whole time. Watching her the whole time. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Oh. Yeah, it's creepy. So, like, the fact that, you know, then they start getting into, like, you know, well, when you hear, well, what's your favorite scary movie? It's like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. who asked that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, okay. And she stayed on the phone with him. And that is where the conversation definitely takes a smooth lift. <laughs> well, yeah, because when you try to get off the phone mm-hmm. and someone says, you hang up, I'll gut you like a fish. I'm like, I guess I got to stay on the phone. And then she starts hearing stuff at different parts of her house. So, like, we know there's, looking back, you know there's more than one person because just the proximity of everything. But at the time, you're like, okay, how are they ringing the doorbell? Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. This was like, you know, before there were more than one killers. Like, this movie established there can be more than one killer. Yes, they did. They did, because we didn't... Nobody knew. Nobody suspected two people being there, working together, you know, and they... I must say, they work together very well. (laughs) Well, you know there's that theory that, like, the reason why Stu and Billy had that type of synergy is because it's very homoerotic, like very like Julius Caesar ish. Yeah, like yeah. there's a you know very homoerotic tone, especially with Stu like always caressing Billy's ears. Absolutely, absolutely. And and as a kid, it does that. It goes right over yeah. our heads. We so don't we don't see best that. Friends. Yeah, you know we don't see that. It's like they just they just friends, you know. So. But, but I like I just remember watching that opening kill and you know he's asking her the questions and I'm answering too because I know the answers too. Mm-hmm. And I remember as a kid saying Jason mm-hmm. in my head. Yep. Because I really didn't realize that like you know you don't remember everything like you do now. Exactly. That the killer was Jason's mom. Exactly. So when she got it wrong I'm like oh my god I'd have been dead too. Right? Right? So it's then then we go into her boyfriend <laughs> poor Steve. Poor Steven. Like, like we just talking about how like nobody ever fucking talks about Steven in these movies. Nobody like, cares. That man's life just did not matter. He, he, nobody even they didn't even mention it at school the next day. Like nobody They even mentioned cared. it like once in like part two, but it's like, you know, R.I.P. like Steven Orth, like your life mattered, bro. Like, yes. Yes. Because he got done dirty. Super dirty. dirty. And then the other thing too, if you listen on the phone, mm-hmm. you can hear like duct tape and you can hear someone being knocked out oh my gosh yes like there's a part where you hear and then you hear oh mm-hmm. yep and i was like how did i never really like notice this stuff before right because you know i feel like the this movie was just such a time capsule and wes craven did such a great job with capturing our fears of our our own homes, you know, oh, being alone. We, I mean, definitely as a kid, me. as a kid, we're already scared of being home alone and scared of the dark. So he combined those two things of like we don't know who is outside. On top of the fact, let's not mention that she was not a babysitter. Exactly. Exactly. She was just there. <laughs> just there, chilling. But just like, okay, so we get to them, you know, she gets the answer wrong. Steven's dead. Like, lights come on, boom, guts is out. Yep. It's a wrap. And she's like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm about to run for it. Yep. <laughs> like, I'm done with this shit. Yep. And you see the ghost face, like, running through that house. And you're like, oh, my God. Girl, yep. Run. Yep. Ghost face mask. How do you, like, just the ghost face mask in itself. It still scares me. I'm 34 years old, bro. I'm still terrified. I, I equate fear to that mask. I don't. I will always equate fear to that mask. It just is because the one horror movie that I still haven't become unafraid of. No, absolutely not. I still get chills during that opening scene. Still, and shame on them for putting us through that. <laughs> and then we have to yeah. still watch the rest yeah. of the movie. <laughs> it's like but how like, do she's <laughs> like she's so she's she does everything that she would do. You try to run for it, yep. and then they're already there. You try to go the other way, and then when she. Hits him at the phone through the Ooh, window. Yes. And you're like, yeah, girl, you got this. Get away. She tried. And, like, she makes she makes it. She, she makes we thought, it out of his house. And that's the thing. We, like, they, that's why I feel like this movie was just written and directed so well. Because we actually thought she was going to make it. She sees her, her parents are pulling up. She, like, she's, 
there and he just grabs her. She looked back. Mm-hmm. And that's what, like the number one rule that's of running. Rule. You know, that's as rule. a black person, you don't turn around. No, you just go. <laughs> no, you just go. So like he's just, and she has the phone. Yep. And her parents go inside and they see everything's destroyed and they pick up the phone to call the police and they can hear her like gurgling. Yeah, on her own blood. And, yeah, mm. and he's just stabbing her and then she's all pale because she's losing blood. And then she just pulls that mask off and you can just see in her face, she's like, what? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. but what? she knows who this is. Yes. What? What is, is you? What are you, why are yeah, you doing why did this? Why you do this? Yes. And then it's over and, and the parents come out and she's hanging from the swing. That, and that, and there we go. Trauma number one. <laughs> yep. And it is terrifying. Absolutely. And I feel like as you get older, especially as a woman, it's even more terrifying. Of course. Of course. Because <laughs> it's like. Have, especially when you have a tree right outside your door. Exactly. Ooh, yes, exactly. So after all that calms down, boom, title, screen. Screen. That's all we get. So we like, all right, this is if this is what we in for. Yeah, we're not playing. They is not playing. And then we get introduced to our beloved Sydney. Sydney. Sydney Prescott. Yeah. I always wondered as as you know, rewatching these movies as an adult, I always wondered what was it about Sydney that made her the trope of like she this th- like the story revolves around her and she's going like I feel like they've established at this point I feel like they've established Sydney is going she's not going to die. Yeah. Anytime soon. So Yeah. I think um he Russ Craven's always made great final girls. Mm-hmm. Cause he gave us Nancy and mm-hmm. he gave us Sydney. Mm-hmm. And I feel like the two things that those two women have in common is they had already experienced such a harsh trauma. Yes. That everything else was like fair game. Mm-hmm. Like with Nancy, her mom was an alcoholic, her parents were divorced mm-hmm. and absent. You know, so she kind of had to raise herself. Yeah. And then with Sydney, she had just lost her mom. So she was already hardened by the world. Yes, absolutely. And the whole town pretty much knew it. Like, I feel like the city, they were very small. It's a very small town. Everybody know everybody's business. And that reputation of her mother followed her along as well. Definitely sins of the parents. Definitely. Definitely. Most definitely. Not mm-hmm. only that, but then she also had the unfortunate situation of finding her mother. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And having to identify and testify against the killer or alleged killer mm-hmm. as we go down the line and find out. So she was all, the worst thing that could have ever happened to her had already happened to her. Right. Right. So she was already kind of hard. Like you can tell her head was always on a swivel from like the That's first true. moment. You interacted with her when mm-hmm. you saw her and Tatum. Mm-hmm. Her head was already on a swivel. Yep. Like when she's watching the news and they're talking about her mom, yep. you know, and then she's on her way to school. Like her head was already on a swivel because mm-hmm. it's the anniversary of her mom's death. Mm-hmm. So as soon as she was like, and the funny thing is that Casey sat next to her in school. Yes. So you know she's like, okay, this is kind of weird. It's kind of close to home again. 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 And she and then, never really got a chance to like rest because no, there's always like you said. Like she, even when you when you get to that fountain scene and you watch everyone's demeanor, you know Billy's relaxed, he's leaning back. Mm-hmm. Tatum's all over Stu. Stu's being goofy. Randy is analyzing, of course. And the whole time, if you watch that scene, Sydney is doing this the whole time. Mm-hmm. She's constantly looking over her shoulder. Mm-hmm. So to me, that was always going to symbolize that she was a lot smarter than your average teen oh, yeah. girl. Oh yeah. Cause one thing about a lot of horror movies, they the reason why a lot of horror movies work is because we see we see random people just make stupid decisions. They're imperfect yeah. characters that make stupid decisions. But Sydney was the one who was kind of sort of always one step ahead. And when she was in a situation where she had to actually fight, she fought. You know, yes. she fought to 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 live. She fought to live every step of the way. 
Yes. Yes. I personally like enjoy the fact just to the just how they set her up. When you first see her and she's in her room and Billy comes to the window, she's just set up so sweetly. Like this is like the sweetest girl you're ever gonna meet. Mm-hmm. And then Billy starts monologuing about how the exorcist made him think about her, which I was like, okay, you're fucking weird. Um, <laughs> red flag number one. <laughs> yeah, red flag number fucking one. If a man ever tells you that, the exorcist reminds them of you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, at least go Linnea Quigley or something. Like, something. Movies, anything, but mm-hmm. not that. No. <laughs> so, when they're, like, doing their PG-13, After her dad comes in to say, okay, I'm leaving, you know, which is great red herring. Dad's gone for the fucking week. Of course. Right? (laughs) Of course. They're they're throwing so much at you in like five minutes. And he turns on the radio. So now as an adult, I'm realizing, oh, because Stu was in there kidnapping her father. Exactly. Ooh. (laughs) Like, ding, ding, ding. All these, like, as, like, so many (laughs) things just go over your head until you, until it's like, what? Yes, because once that. you know there's two killers, yes. you're like, okay, well, this is how this happened. Because yes. it's like, okay, how did he get kidnapped? Because mm-hmm. you're only thinking about one killer. Yeah. But yeah, that's always like, like Skeet Ulrich, for all intents and purposes, is creepy as shit in this movie. Oh, and yeah. he's one of those people to, like, I feel like scream damaged him because I'll never unsee Billy Loomis. I know. I know. It's like that. He played that role so good that it's like, it's going to be very hard. To, to not see him in that role. You know, yeah. he has to go, he's going to have to go so far out the box in order for us to like really let that go. But And another fun fact is that they actually wanted Johnny Depp to play that role. Really? That's why he looks Johnny Depp-ish. Yes. Yes. Okay, I can see that. I can yep. definitely see that. It worked out. It worked out. I'm not sure how you how you think that would have changed the movie if it would have been Johnny. Oh Depp. no, I think it would still be a smash, and that's only because you know Johnny Depp's first movie was a Nightmare on Elm Street, so it's not yes. like he hasn't worked with West yes. before. So I I think he's still. I mean, he Ulrich is a baby Johnny Depp. Let's just call it what it is. He is. He definitely <laughs> so is. He is. It still worked out. He's still attractive. You know, they're both attractive. Very attractive. Um, especially I in just, that time, they're in their prime. You know. Yes. Face-wise. I just love the little details, like at the fountain scene. Like that's like one of my favorite scenes because it's like all friends, right? Like they give you like the friends montage. They do. They absolutely do. And if you notice, other movies mimic that. They mimic that in I I know what you did last summer. Oh yeah. They try to mimic it in what was that other movie? I forgot the one movie. Um, of course, scary movie. You know, scary movie did a parody yeah, but, of everything. You know, Kevin, but Kevin Williamson wrote scary, scary movie. He wrote Scream. Yeah, and he wrote I still I know what you did last summer. Yep. So, so you know they they use, and Dawson's Creek and all and that shit. So all it all blend into each other. Of course, of course. You know, some ninety something friends. You know, and the funny thing is, the actual working title of Scream was scary movie. Yep. I did. So, like, I do remember hearing that. <laughs> more hilarious. Hilarious. But that fountain scene so great, and I feel like the best part of the fountain scene is Randy because one thing about Randy Meats, baby, he gonna give you the tea. Yes, and straight up, he gonna give you the tea no, straight no up. And and he low key be knowing though that be he, a thing. He calls out every time. There is not every time Randy says something. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. Because that interaction between Randy and Stu and Tatum is so iconic. Mm-hmm. When she's like, well, Stu was with me last night. And he's like, is that before or after? He's still iced and diced. And mm-hmm. it's like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm so sad that Randy was not a character that continued longer in the franchise. Yes, but tech, but the crazy part is Randy wasn't supposed to even make it out of part one. He wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't. <laughs> if, if, if Jamie Kennedy hadn't had a pacemaker, mm-hmm. they would have quibbed him on his right, his, uh, his left side by his heart, and he wouldn't have made it. Mm-hmm. Him having that pacemaker, they couldn't legally fake shoot him there. Right. So that's why he made it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. But I love, I love Brandy because Brandy is just like so cued into 
something's wrong with these two. Yep. And I'm the only one that notices it. Mm-hmm. So I will give them credit that they played Randy up as like the nice guy and he really was the nice guy. He really was. He really like, truly he was. He never like was a creeper. Right. <laughs> so right. I always appreciate that. Yep. And I love that he he called out he really actually called out horror the horror franchise in itself. Yep. Which is like it's almost like seeing yes, yes. So that's that's the conversation we have to get into, right? So Scream was like the blueprint for the well, I'm gonna say the blueprint because the blueprint for the meta commentary was Wes Craven's new nightmare. He yes. tested out the meta theory with that. Mm-hmm. But Scream brought the meta theory to the masses. It did. So yeah, the whole we're in a movie within a movie and we know we're in a movie. Yeah. That was a game changer right there because yeah. nobody was doing that. No. Nobody. Nobody was doing that. And when he did it and it worked, then it became like, okay, we can do it. Yeah. We can do that. We can do that. You know? And yes. slight, slight side note, I would have wanted to see that stab movie. <laughs> like I wanted okay. to see. We, people are really I think there's like a stab cut. Of like all the trailers, yeah, yeah, yeah. on YouTube, it's like but a super, yeah, super I would trailer. Be a real stab movie, yeah. personally. I yeah. think it's time. Like we yeah. can totally have a real stab movie. Yeah, this like, it, it's time. At least make it like fan. Everyone says fiction. that the stab movies are killing the screen franchise. I think they're hilarious. It works. It makes money. <laughs> People does, going to see them, you know. <laughs> but we. Are, you know, we go through the school day. They're talking about what happened at the fountain. Sydney goes home. Mm-hmm. She's chilling. She goes into the closet. Nothing's there. Mm-hmm. And when she walks back by it, you see the closet like slightly open. Right, right. And it's like, okay, so how long have they been in her house? Exactly. Because she falls asleep. Yep. And she wakes up and it's dark and she gets that phone call. And there we go. And here goes the by the far sh- one of my favorite like top three phone calls is this phone call, mm-hmm. Randy's phone call, and her phone call in Screen Five. But we'll get to that down the line. Yep. But I love this phone call for one. There's one specific line in Sydney's first phone call where they ask her about what's her favorite scary movie. Mm-hmm. And she says, oh, I hate those. And he's like, really? And she's like, yeah, there's always some big breasted girl running upstairs. And she should be going out the door. It's insulting. Mm-hmm. By far the best line in the movie. Best today. line. Because she. Besides that, and hit it. me with the phone dick. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> nailed it. Like, she nailed it. Because it's like, that's exactly what they do. J- just for her to five minutes later. Yes. Run up the stairs. She exactly. The door open. Exactly. And I'm like watching that now as an adult. I'm like, see, <laughs> see. Like, I what? love it. <laughs> but when they so start talking many. about her mom, she's like swivel. Yep. Okay, of course. Where are you? Where are you? Yep. And what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. And then they just explode. He just explodes out the closet. Yep. The same like, closet. The same pup just explodes out the closet, mm-hmm. and one of our epic Sydney chase scenes. That, that was a good. On. That was a. I, I like. I really enjoy that whole scene. Yeah. With her, I I, I enjoyed it to the max. Yes. Adrenaline was pumping. Yes. Adrenaline was going when she because I'm because we are because we still as a viewer you really still don't know. Yeah, she, this... like, she runs towards the door. She's trying to get the door open. He stabs. She ducks. She takes his legs out from under him. Let's talk about that fucking the... 90s judo move. The girl can like... fight. She can hold her own. And then she runs upstairs and she double doors his ass. Mm-hmm. Which I've always loved that trick. And I've always loved houses with doors like that with the closets right next to you. Can oh, lock yeah. Them in. oh, yeah. <laughs> and she 911s on the internet. Mm-hmm. And then. Gone. Yep. Boom. Gone. Just poof. Gone. Gone. And that's when she knows she fucked up. Like he got away. Yes. And like who pops through the window? Hmm. So convenient, right? So convenient. So convenient. And 
then the phone drops and you're just like okay mm-hmm. this can't be this obvious because mm-hmm. that was a that was the first point of like okay it's him yeah so it's it him. can't be this obvious yep and then he had the creepy face too like it can't it can't yeah be. Yeah, give it to us on a silver platter. No, right, we gotta work for it. We gotta earn it. We gotta earn. The That's what answer. I love about Scream is because like they give you like the most obvious shit, and it's up to you to believe it or not. Yep. And then it's like, what well, is it? Yeah. <laughs> and then Deputy Dewey shows up. The mask is outside, and then you start looking at him like it might be him. Yeah. That and his low key like creepy obsession with his sister's his younger sister's friend. Yes. So they have totally like sidestep the rest of the series, like the first movie, he was totally in love with her. Yes. He <laughs> was. They you know, that was a another left turn. Like, okay, we're we're gonna spin this. Not gonna yeah. work. How do you Are feel you like Dewey how, what what do you feel like his character represents? Because he survives through a lot of shit. But for the first movie, what do you think he represents? So for the first movie, Dewey is completely like, I feel like he's your red herring comic relief. Mm -hmm. But there's something so charming about him in that first movie because he's just a deputy. He just wants to do good. Yep. And see, because that goes to the second movie, so we can't even talk about that. But the way he explains himself in the like the, the rest of the movies you start to piece together what he was in the first movie does that make sense yeah like he says things and he declares things about himself in part two and part three mm-hmm. and then four and five to where when you take all that information and go back to the first one it's like oh okay yeah you are that person yeah because he really didn't know he really didn't know who he was building up in each each film i feel like dewey had to stand in his own of who yeah. he was he had to really convince everybody like who he was and what he was well, capable he, of he tells gail point blank in part two he's like how do you know that the way that i act isn't a way to get people to lower their sense of self and expectations around me exactly that way i can get what i need so when you think of it from that way, yes. you understand that the dopiness is really just an act. It is. It is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is smart. He's absolutely smart. And, and I would smart be, enough. Yeah. He was smart enough to hitch himself to Gail. Exactly. Because I was I was always wondering, how did he pull Gail? How did he pull he her? Was, he was smart enough to know she's going to figure this out and I need to be next to her when she does. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he was he 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 played he played a good pivotal role in the franchise. And mm-hmm. just as as a standalone character, his character development throughout Scream was very good. And it was written yeah. very well. Like it was very realistic. Yeah. No, Dewey definitely Dewey, I feel like Dewey and Gil have the best art. Mm-hmm. I just feel like people always want to focus on Sydney because she's the quote unquote star of the franchise. Exactly. But you know, we've we've discussed my theories on Gail Weathers. <laughs> and we will get to that. And we will absolutely get to that. And what do you yeah, what do you feel about how Dewey's sister was okay, Sydney's like, best friend? Like what do, what do you think their their thought process was behind killing Sydney's best friend? I feel like Tatum is one of those characters that, like, you wish would. If I ha- and I know people are gonna give me flack for saying this, but if I had to trade one or the other, I would have rather had Dewey go and keep Tatum. Hmm. Interesting. Because Tatum in that movie is like the most forgotten about supporting character. She was because she's so ride or die, and I feel like. The movie, I feel like emotionally Sydney fell apart when she realized Tatum was dead and that's when she was like okay they have to die because mm-hmm. when she saw her body it was like one of her, the most horrifying scenes acted yeah. by yeah. Matt Campbell yeah. I feel like Tatum was like a rock for her you know she lost her mom Yeah. she didn't really trust Billy yeah. right I mean to be real she wasn't like feeling Billy because Billy's attitude mm-hmm. but she always had Tatum yeah I 
I hate that they did have Tatum. She was very forgettable beyond Scream 1. And I wish they had built a story arc for her to go yeah. to college with Sydney. Right. She could have. She could have. She, sure. she definitely could have. Because there were so many throwaway characters in Scream yeah, 2. Too. Absolutely. She so many throwaway. Played, like, she could have. She could have definitely played the Hallie character. And she definitely would have been a sorority girl off red. Absolutely. Like, absolutely it like it didn't have to be story. like i feel like they focused on throughout the whole franchise it was sydney dewey gail those three like they were the yeah. the, the big three and tatum she could have been in there too yeah like she there's there's no reason why she couldn't have survived yeah and, and gone through that with sydney now do i think she should have survived the entire franchise no, no. But see, I think we got that. Like, I feel like the thing that was a scream is like when they take someone away, mm -hmm. they always reincarnate them in another character. And I feel like Kirby is Tatum. Yeah. Reincarnating. There we go. Yep. Yep. So I mean, everybody always associates her with Randy because she's a horror nerd, and I see her more as Tatum. Yes. Absolutely. That ride or die best friend that will like kick somebody's ass for you. Like, I think that's what Kirby is. Mm -hmm. But that's just me though. But yeah, Tatum should have stuck around. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Next part, we are introduced, and I feel like Gail came through like a fucking wrecking ball. <laughs> Top five bitches in cinema history. You hear me? All time, like all time. Like she came through like a total bitch. Like with the devil wears Prada. Yes, yes. What do you think her character represents for not only Scream One but for the entire franchise? Well, like I told you. Personally, um, Scream to me has always been Gail's perspective. Mm -hmm. Like she says, when I wrote, I wrote the book on this. Like that's literally what it is. Like mm -hmm. wrongfully accused was the book that she wrote before the Woodsboro Murders, which was about Cotton Leary's possible innocence. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. Her plight was to get Cotton out of jail, and would antagonize the shit out of Sydney to do so. Yes. That he didn't do it. Yes. Um. So had Gail not written that book and not caused so much attention to Cotton not being a suspect, I wonder if the murder spree would even happen. That's a that is a very valid question because right. she spawned that book spawned so much chaos. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and and I mean that book is really the the solid. That's the real reason why so many things happened in the sequels that followed Scream. Yeah, absolutely. And on top of that, like you can look at Billy and Stu as your antagonist, but Sydney's real antagonist was Gail Weathers. Always. Always was Gail. Always. Always. <laughs> so you, you can't have the franchise without her because she's the one, she's murder she wrote. She's telling the story. Mm -hmm. She's keeping the cycle going because the books turn into the stabs mm -hmm. and then the stabs turn into crazy subredditors. Yes. So if, if it wasn't for Gail, none of this would have happened. So therefore, to me, she is the central antagonist. Yes. So you can't have Scream without her. Yep. Yep. There's many people who want her to be dead. I get it. But nope. if you look at it from a real writing perspective, that's your real antagonist. Absolutely. From the moment she walked on the scene, Absolutely. she antagonized Sydney. Absolutely. She ass raw the whole movie. Oh, on her ass the whole movie. Like, in her face with a, ca with a camera yeah. and a microphone. What like do you how, think? <laughs> how like fucked up of a person do you have to be to get punched by a seventeen year old girl on national television? <laughs> so which Tatum, boom, bitch went down. Like, and even through all the other movies, like literally, it took five movies for Gail and Sydney to actually have a real hug, un not uncomfortable embrace. Yes, yes, which shows I like. I really like that. That's another subplot that helps move each plot along through mm -hmm. the main like the main plot each screen has a main plot but that's a subplot that gets carried on from movie to movie to movie but, I mean, like you i started to fall in love with gail in part two mm -hmm. i love gail in part one mm -hmm. I, every time i see her i want to slap her mm -hmm. with her little new suits and the fluffy hair 
And then when she's all kissy up to do it, you're just like, she's using you. Yep. But like, as an adult, I realized he was using her too. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But at the time, it's like, she doesn't even like you. She just wants to get close to the case. Mm hmm. They both had like, agendas, they both had yes. ulterior motives that they were moved by. She, I mean, I get her point of when she said, hey, you know, your mother's death was the biggest story of last year and someone was going to write a book about it. But you don't have to tell the girl you're going to send her a copy. Girl. Like, it's the audacity. If one thing Gail had, she had audacity. That movie. Like, she was out of pocket. Out way, of fucking pocket. Way out of pocket. Even when her greedy ass is talking to Kenny and she's like, when Finney realizes that Gail might be right when Gail says, you know, she said, I saw Cotton leave my house that night. And she goes, no, you saw, you saw someone wearing Cotton's coat leave that night. And mm-hmm. she turns to Kenny and she's like, I could get an innocent man out of jail. Mm-hmm. Do you know what that's going to do for my book sales? And it's just like, you, that's all, it. you almost had it. That's it. That's, that's all she cared about. You almost had it. Almost. So close. So close. Like swing and a miss instantly. So, yeah. Gail was a needed she was a very much so needed antagonist as well like she was like even the killer you know the killers they were the the movie's antagonists that they wanted us to think but the real antagonist was always gail the media the media and that's really the whole that's another kind of like little jab at society right there Oh yeah, because, because the media circus, real. the media circus oh, that yeah. came to that small little town again. Yep, a again year later. Yeah, and then you know, you know, the media they love a good anniversary of such and such. Yeah, and then your dad's like nowhere around. Yeah, like, yeah, you're just dealing with this all by yourself in the course of like three days. Mm-hmm. But I love you know when she when Billy drops that phone and she's like, yeah, it's him. And yep. go to the police station. Yep. And his dad is there, and you realize that that's the guy that's been hooking up with Sydney's mom. That's it. Right, looking back on it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you don't know that at the time, but looking back, you're like, oh, okay, he was tapping it. Yep. And when they go to school the next day, and she talks to Stu, and Stu's looking in the mirror, checking out his bruise, and uh, She's like talking about Billy, and he's like, "Oh, since you branded him the Candy Man, he's like, no, his heart, heart's broken." <laughs> this movie has so many good little like quotable, quotable. Like this movie was so quotable. It was a, t- it's just a time capsule of the '90s. It is the, it is the '90s in that movie. So '90s essence. Every I just I love that scene, and then Tatum smacks him with the tootsie roll pop, yes. and she's just like, "Do you <laughs> on his forehead?" <laughs> and people are running up and down the hallways in ghost face costumes as kids would, yeah, because it's a joke, mm-hmm. you know. And then we get to when she finally sees him again, and he's still like so apathetic. Oh yeah, to what she's going through in your mm-hmm. life. This can't be the killer. Like you're her boyfriend, though. Like, yes, you're supposed to love her. Yes, right? and that's where it's like, as as a viewer, they they put us against our own judgments at first. Like, okay, well, we I thought it was him. In the movie, did I get the vibe that they were a couple? Nope. Nope. Like he did not like her ass, and I'm trying to understand why she didn't realize that he didn't like her. Mm-hmm. She just didn't, you know, just didn't see it. She had other things. She had other things, I guess she was... Uh, yeah, I, yeah. You I know, she got the Gail shit too. going on. Yeah. Her, the anniversary of her mom, you know. But anybody could tell. Her, her looming virginity. Yes! And that was also, like, you know, a kind of cliche for the 90s because yeah. the virgins... Yeah, she's they a good never, girl, Yeah, you know? they're, they're clean, they're pure. The virgins never die, right? Right. I just went... Like, can we ever talk about, like, I still to this day want to know who was in the bathroom. Now, we know for a fact it wasn't Billy because he couldn't have got there that fast without her seeing it, mm-hmm. right? Because she's in the stall and those girls talking shit about her and they leave and then the ghost face is at the bathroom stall. Mm-hmm. Couldn't have been Billy because she would have seen him come in or the girls would have seen him come in. Yeah. Okay. Two, it's not Stu because Stu has on khaki pants. Yeah. Right, and no boots. Who 
was in the bathroom. And people keep saying, like, oh, it was a prankster because they didn't have a weapon. I don't know. Cause they seem to really be coming at her. They did. And that's, yeah, that that scene always, that like, that was always a scene where I'm like, but who was it, though? <laughs> like, but who was it? I, I, I want to chalk it up to one of those situations where they wrote themselves into a corner. Yes. Yes. Writers do that a lot. Yeah. And it's like, like well, we'll just like have like that that never can, happened. We'll just, yeah, we'll like, just have like that never happened. You know? <laughs> we'll just teleport it into the bathroom. But, yeah, it always freaks me out if there was someone waiting. Because <laughs> my brain goes, well, how did they know that she was going into that bathroom specifically? Right. And how long did they wait in that stall? Mm-hmm. Cause they, so they, they really didn't give us, writing. they didn't even give us any like foreshadowing either yeah. of, you know, who it could have been. Like the camera, the, there was no camera action of like, yeah. it could have been this person. Chalk it up to, to a writing faux pas. Yeah. But yeah, you know, she, she does her power slide to the bathroom door and everybody thinks she's crazy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Stu's like, yeah, I'm throwing this party. There's a curfew. Come on through. <laughs> because it's, that's a good idea, right? It's not the 90s unless you throw a party I mean, a, a murder spree. It might be a murder spree going on, but let's party. You know? We're going we're gonna to drink, and we're going to have premarital sex. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. We're going to die. We're going to die happy. At least. And and even in that even in that party scene, that it, even in the whole aspect of the party, Randy was still the one dropping gems. Okay, so yeah, let's not even get to the like he's talking about the party. He says like, yeah, cool, I'll come. Mm-hmm. Then we get to principal getting attacked. Yes, and we know that that's Billy because she was outside. Right, right, because the principal's tired of people fucking around with these masks on. Yeah, he was over it. He thinks it's another prankster. Yeah, he gets mobbed. Like man, I felt like what was the point? Of killing the principal. Oh, because you're in high school and you just want to kill your principal for making your life live in hell. I mean, I get it. I get the motivation. I get it, but then it's like to the to the to the story at hand. Like okay, to the story at hand. These niggas was just wilding. <laughs> they had well, if you if you think about it, that was the reason why everyone left the party. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it was a distraction. Kill. It was a good distraction. It was a, yeah. it was a, it was a distraction kill. Okay, I get that. I get that. So we get that, and then we see Sydney and Tatum talking on Tatum's porch. Mm-hmm. They're about to go to the store to get stuff for the party, and you see the ghost face in the bushes. Like I said, there are so many random ghost faces. It's like, is this a killer or is this just somebody mm-hmm. stalking them? Like, mm-hmm. who's stalking them? Because you see them again in the grocery store. Again, again. So it's like foreshadowing is letting us know. Mm. Yes, and there's so many theories out there about who it could have been. Like, I'll save the rest for different movies, but for this one, everyone always says, like, well, Dewey was in on it. I was like, no, he wasn't. <laughs> Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No. I can't see that. I can't see. Yeah. I can't see that as a theory just because it doesn't make sense for, for the, the movies that proceed after this, it just doesn't right. make sense. But then, like, right after that, boom, we hear Randy talking to Stu mm-hmm. in the video store mm-hmm. going over the theories, and Stu's like, well, I think it's her dad, because why can't they find him? And he's like, it's a red herring. And he gives us the everybody's a suspect. Everybody, literally. And at that point in the movie, we are, like, we're at the height we're at the height yeah. of, we still don't know. The movie, we halfway through it, we still don't know who is it. And I love it, because he's like, yeah, every minute of it. It could be you. Yep. Everybody, is, and everybody just stops and looks at him. Yep. Because at the time, I was low-key thinking, could it be Randy? Right. He, he know a little bit too much. He know just and, a little bit too much. And the fact that He's talking shit about Billy and just turns like right around into him. Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. so high school. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> just not being aware and just saying whatever the fuck you're thinking. And that person's right there. Exactly. <laughs> Classic. Like that's so like so good. So such yes. a good scene. And that's a good segue. Know, watching the movie now, you see how menacing he is towards them. Oh yeah. Right? Like he's so menacing towards Randy and you think before it's like because he likes Sydney and he's trying to get with his girl. Mm-hmm. But you realize it's because like, oh no, he knows. Yeah. He knows so too much. Like, 
and Stu's just like back behind Randy, like playing with Right. <laughs> being like the most ultimate goofball ever. Always. Always. Always on that bullshit. Always. Like, who would stand behind somebody while they're getting threatened and just be like, Yep. <laughs> Iconic. I, this is why this movie is iconic and quotable because it's like every those little things leave a stain on you. Where it's like yeah. I remember that part. Like I remember every part of this movie in that yes, part. Every out. time I watch it, I watch it as if I haven't seen it like thirty times. Yes, yes. And it still messes with me. I yes. still catch things I enjoy. But then, mm-hmm. boom, we get to the party. The party's jumping. Everybody's doing their thing. They get drunk. They having a good time. They watching. Halloween. Yep. <laughs> iconic. And fucking Gail was bitch ass. <laughs> Her little news fan. Yeah. You know, showing up with Dewey, buddy, and up to him and sneaks the camera near the VCR. Yes. And I always love when they're like, what is she doing here? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. He's like, she's with me. Ooh, why? Like, Tatum was so pissed. Man, everybody, man, everybody was pissed. Side eye, and like, like you brought this bitch. Like, the old bitch here. We and don't want her here. That, she slips that camera in, and she goes back to the news van. And Kenny's like, "Yeah, it's working." And then he says, "It's on a thirty-second delay." And mm. you know that means something, but mm-hmm. you don't know what that mm-hmm. means. Mm-hmm. You know it's important, but you don't know why. Why? That's the thing. We back of your mind is like, well, why? Why? But they, you know, they're in the party, you know, they're watching Halloween and, you know, Randy hits us with the rules. Gym number one. Rule number one. <laughs> and he, but he wasn't lying. That's the thing. Yeah. It's like, he ain't lying. He yeah, is not lying. Drink. Don't have sex. Don't say you'll be right back. Don't, don't say, you. and I mean, that was the most, that was the most serious yeah. one right there don't say i'll be back like don't say it don't do it don't do it and it's crazy because like right before they get to the rules right like sydney's talking about billy randy's pissed off that she's talking about billy and Stu sends tatum to go get beer mm-hmm. right and it's like now you know better so you know he was setting her up of right? course of course and everybody swears up and down that billy killed Stu. i think Stu killed tatum yeah that Billy killed Tatum. I think Stu killed Tatum. I think so too. I feel like Billy was still dealing with the principal situation. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 That makes sense. That makes yeah, perfect like, sense. To, if they said that, you know, it, we'll get to that part. But I feel like he sent her to get beer. Randy says, don't ever say you'll be right back. And Stu goes, you want a beer? Yeah. So he goes, I'll be right back. And then he disappears in the same door. Yep. Right. So... And just the stature, like, it just, it makes sense, right? Yeah. And we, you know, we lose Tatum, and she fought, too, because she was fucking him up with them beer bottles. Yes. I, you know, that was another, that was another fight scene where I thought she was going to make it. Had, I'm telling you, and I have, I have done my due diligence. She tried to crawl through that door through her shoulders, and I'm a big shoulder girl myself. Mm -hmm. Had she had just she could have made it like she could have slid right through i was mad about that i was very hurt about that because i was like out of all the ways she could have died yeah i I feel like they tried they they did see her a little bit with her death like they made her seem stupider than what she was Mm -hmm. because she tried to go through the dog door and i feel like they should either just stab her up or she could have got through the door or something like she could have tried to open the door and he just grabbed her back in the door closed. yeah yeah it, yeah it was well she was right by the door and i to my knowledge and maybe my memory just foggy i remember her hitting him with the bill bottles she hit him with the fridge and she was almost at the door i'm still not understanding why she ran to the garage door maybe i missed that yeah i, I missed that too because i was like I really thought she was gonna make it. Like you yeah, know, that was another that door. Right. She knocked him on the ground. Like it was just one person, and she was yeah. getting the best of him. Yeah, like she was actually getting the best of him. Yeah, so Fucking we just have up. a mental note for the fact that like Ghostface as a as a hide, right? Since there's so many of them, 
are some of the most chaotically clumsy, non-hit taken ass human beings on the planet. Like, <laughs> and as somebody who studies serial killers and shit, like psychos, you can take a hit. These motherfuckers could not take a I mean, a punch they was nothing. falling, get, like, easily. Sydney, hell, Sydney was fucking them up. I'm just saying, like, if you stab multiple people at this point, you would think you'd be able to, like, take a hit. Or have some type of endurance to be able to agility like you would have some right. agility test or something like they were always like puffing and grunting yes like are y'all this out of shape y'all are in high school at this point i mean once we once we find out who the killer was like you and the girls are in high school right. how are y'all how are y'all this i also never understood how like nobody saw tatum's body like i think if i'm wrong the proximity of like the the garage is to like the right of the front door yeah yeah or, yeah. The, or, the, or the side of the house yeah but like all those people like you know once randy's sitting there watching me he gets the phone call that principal henry is hung up on a gold post which is definitely this is billy mm -hmm. because he's still doing his party thing mm -hmm. you know and everybody leaves yep like I wonder, like, nobody saw, like, some legs hanging in a distance? Like, not, like maybe I'm just weird. Like, Because it's a pretty small town. That's why I'm like, it's a small town. Everybody talks. Everybody sees everything. Nobody saw nothing. Yeah, so everybody's out the house. Randy's like, fuck it. I'm going to get drunk and watch Halloween. I want to see some Jamie Lee Curtis City. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And we get the, Jamie, Jamie, look behind you. Mm -hmm. And it, it's right behind Jamie. Like, yep. Like, literally. That would, like, man, the writing directing is, it was on point. It was and hitting. And goes, he's gonna get it. He's like, gonna get no it. He's yes. He's gonna get it. Yes. And then, you know, we see it in the news van, and Sydney's at the news van at this point. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, sorry. I, I skipped a step. So, she went upstairs. She banged Billy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. She lost her virginity. Yep. She lost her virginity. She Billy kind of, and but the way, I feel like the way she did it and the way it happened, it still was kind of cringy. It was a, no, it was, a, it was a pity fuck. Let's just call it what it is. It was. That's why I was like. She felt bad. She felt bad for sending him to jail. Yeah. Um, like, it was cringy as hell. Like, which is so high school to be like, oh, I have to. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because you I know, it, I can make it up to you guys. Mm -hmm. And she was so, teasing him the whole movie anyway, so it's like, come on, like, it, it, it's gonna happen. And then Billy gets attacked, right? Mm -hmm. And at that time, you're like, oh shit, it wasn't him. Yep, they got yeah. us. Okay. They got us with that. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, and we was wrong the whole out, time. She runs out the house, right? I think at this point she. No, she doesn't see Tatum yet. She's going straight out the front door. Mm -hmm. Jamie's drunk. Randy's drunk on the couch. She runs to the news van, and Kenny's in there, and he's watching it. And yep. he's like, oh, my God, he's right behind him. Mm -hmm. And then you turn, and you see that front door open, mm -hmm. and it's nobody there. And you're like, 30-second mm -hmm. delay. That 30-second delay. Yep. That's poor Kenny's neck. Yep. Yep. Oh, I did. Oh. Oh. I didn't want. And, and I didn't then, want him to die. I didn't. Because he he throws Sydney into the news van and slams the door. So if it wasn't for Kenny, Sydney would have been dead. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right, like Kenny's an unsung hero. R.I.P. Because he definitely sacrificed himself for Sydney. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Gail and Julie are like stalking around the land, and they come across Neil Prescott's car. Yeah. So they split up. Gail's on her way back, getting attacked or whatever. Sydney's getting out the news van. I love when Gail tries to like drive the news van and yeah. crashes it because yeah. Kenny's body just like slides down. Ooh, yes. That, oh my gosh. Creeped and me she out. crashes the news van. Sydney's just running for her fucking life mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. It's just chaos. This last act, just, uh, everybody's everywhere all at once. Do we get stabbed? Yes. Yes. And it's like, yeah. and then when, and then those, those words of Randy rang true everybody's a suspect <laughs> right <laughs> we so, don't know yeah gail is knocked out she's been the news van somewhere knocked out mm -hmm. dewey is stabbed up on the front porch yep then he runs back into the house and randy and Stu both run up pleading their case and right. she goes fuck you both and yep. she goes, <laughs> <laughs> 
fuck y'all, okay? She's not going to be able to do it. <laughs> yep. That was right? the most sense that I've seen a white woman ever make in any horror movie. Ever. Ever. <laughs> and then Billy comes stumbling downstairs with, like, and when you watch it, it's, like, the worst-looking makeup effect. Like, you can tell they made it themselves. Yeah, yeah, Like, it was just, it really was just, like, straight corn syrup. Like, yeah. <laughs> at all right it wasn't in the budget you know the budget the, yeah. the budget was spent at that point like we gotta just do what we can <laughs> yeah like no one's gonna notice nobody's she gonna knows. notice she, at all <laughs> she gives billy the fucking gun and they excuse me open the door and randy's like Stu's lost his mind so you already know who yep. one of them is yep right yep Stu's lost his mind and he shoots randy mm. <clears throat> that's where i was like you gotta be kidding me <laughs> and then he hits you with the we all go a little mad sometimes. It's like, you creepy horror movie geek. And then it's like, we knew it. <laughs> so his back, like, we knew it was him. <laughs> like, we knew it was And what always kills me is I feel like maybe Sydney didn't hear Randy say Stu's lost his mind because yeah. when she runs into him, she's like, oh my God, Stu, help me. Yep. Yep. Automatically. He pulls out the voice changer. Mm hmm. And then we get our obligatory villain monologue about why he's doing this which is which is a very necessary point it is it is but at the same time like that's how people get away like i don't have time if i'm a villain like if i'm killing people i'm not gonna tell you why like what's the point i know why you about to be dead that's it that's it you know that's really all that matters I won, you lost. You won. <laughs> so that's it. Like one for me. But of and course find, they have you it. You find out that he is just like the mama's boy of all mama's boys. Like let's just call it what it is. Yep. Right. Yep. Like oh, your mom was sleeping with my dad, and it made my mom abandon me. So now everybody has to die. Mm-hmm. Typical, you know. Typical fragile, white boy. Fragile, fragile shit. Right? Typical white boy like, shit, you know. When you realize that they killed her mom and like raped her. Yeah. That is where things got a little like, real for me. Watching yeah. it as an older. I'm like, damn, like they 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 really not all, like we haven't and at this point we haven't seen Sydney's mom at all. But we yeah. know Maureen Prescott went through it, honey. She right. went through and it. Right, and Sue's like, yeah, it was fun. And it's like, oh, these motherfuckers are disturbed. Very disturbed. And very. on top of that, when you realize that, like, okay, cool. Like, Billy's motive, though, very, like, super male toxic, mm-hmm. right? Like, on the highest degree. Oh, yeah. Sue literally had no motive. It was like. He just he wanted to. It. He was just a fucked up person. Like, he just wanted to yeah. kill some people. <laughs> Because it's fun. Like, he just wanted to kill her. I I get so frustrated with the franchise that just, like, they're always like, well, Billy Loomis started this. And it's like, did you forget about the other crazy motherfucker that didn't have a reason? He was legit insane. Like, Like, he was legit a psychopath. For fun. For funsies. (laughs) For funsies. And got, like, the most childlike thrill out of it. Mm -hmm. And almost got away with it. Now, if you go through some of these scenes, like there's remember the scene where Sydney goes through the attic before she like falls on the boat when Ghostface is chasing her. Yes, yes. Okay, if you scream like like pause the scene before she gets to the window, there are like dolls in the background, and one of them is like strung up like Casey Becker. So that motherfucker was up there practicing. Oh wow! Wow. Okay. Like, there's so many things that you miss. Like, yes, like, yes. Like, it's layers. It's definitely layers to it. I'm so disturbed. But mm-hmm. yeah, so you get to the monologue and they're going to blame it on the movies because movies don't create psychos, Sydney. Mm-hmm. Movies <laughs> make psychos more creative. <laughs> iconic line right there. Another <laughs> iconic line. Like, ooh, ooh. And they just start stabbing. Well, they bring her dad out first, and you yes. realize this poor man has been like bound and gagged in the basement. He's been beaten. Yeah, they beat his ass. Okay, like, he lost his wife. He's about to lose his daughter, and like, he's and they're gonna down for it. Yeah, he's going down for it. And I mean, you gotta admit, their plan kind of, sort of, would have worked. It definitely would have worked. 
definitely. That's, that's what makes it foreign, so. A foreign husband on yes. the anniversary of his wife's death. Absolutely. I mean, that's a clear cut, dry, closed case right there. Like, sounds like investigation ID to me. Exactly. T that is a typical Tuesday on the ID channel. Okay. So they were. So not only were these two young men just crazy as fuck, especially especially Stu, crazy as fuck, psychopaths. But they are manipulative enough to think of a of an actual smart plan that would have worked. Yes, but I love that meta commentary on people blaming movies for psychopathic behavior as yep. if it's just not something that's ingrained in people. Yeah, little it's, it's a little like they, little, they, little jab they, right there of like, like society. Being a psychopath, mm -hmm. being a sociopath is just like saying I like the color yellow. You either do or you don't. Like right. it has nothing to do with what the content you're digesting. Nothing at all. If that's the case, we'd be some serial killers, right? Right? Like, okay. Not, I mean, if that's the case, then I would be having the OnlyFans right now because of all the little Kim I listened to growing up. Exactly! <laughs> okay? The f hardcore. Hardcore little Kim? Mm. Mm hmm. So. Okay, I, I would be Foxy Brown right now, but that's besides the point. The point is, I love that commentary about, you know, blaming the movies because yeah. Wes had gotten so much shit for that his whole career. He got a lot of shit for that. A right? lot. A lot. So. I love that, mm -hmm. and uh, they just start stabbing each other to make it look like, you know, we're gonna survive the sequel. Yeah. Because nowadays <laughs> you gotta have a sequel, yep. baby. <laughs> and he yes. starts spitting on himself. Yes. <laughs> He's so into it. That boy it's was so acting. That every movie hit the spit scene too. Yes. <laughs> that boy was, so, was, ooh, was like he was mm -hmm. acting. Like he. Sweating. Matthew Lillard, man, standing ovation. I actually oh, did a standing when I rewatched Scream many, many, many years later. He got a standing ovation for me in my living room. The fact that most of his like quality lines that we love for ad libs will give me that's. A standing I mean, that is that that just shows how phenomenal he is. And I promise you, if I ever go to a horror convention, because he does like you know meet and greets, and apparently like he talks to his fans, he hugs them, he takes. Like he's really he's interactive. He's yeah. He also has a Dungeons and Dragons company. I follow him on Instagram. Okay, okay. For any geekies out there who are into D and D, he has a whole company. They sell the whole like book, the board, the die, all that shit. So wow. Okay. Go to Matthew Lillard's Instagram. Check him out. The site's pretty cool. I'm not check it. into D and D. I'm not there yet, but yeah. I have a starter. We bought a starter kit from Walmart. We still haven't cracked it open yet because okay. we need time. And Sean is a terror. At oh yeah, right now, so. that that is that is a whole niggas have a whole day for that. <laughs> yeah, we need time. Yes. So, yeah, like just the fact that he ad with all those scenes. If I ever meet that man in person, I like already told Courtney, I was like, you're gonna look at me really weird. Fangirl, like, we is going all yeah, full out. Like, Fangirl, I'm, I'm, like. <laughs> When we went to Horror Hound when I was pregnant, mm -hmm. being in the same, like, when I tell you I was, like, five feet away from, like, Freddy Krueger, like, Robert England. Oh. 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 Like, I sat in on a panel and watched him talk. Oh. What? Do you know what I mean? I got what? to see, like, the OG Michael Myers, Nick Castle, in the mask. I got to meet, Dan I have an autographed picture from Daniel Harris. What? Yes. Oh, no. Yes, Ooh. from Halloween 4 and 5. I have an autographed picture of her and the, the actual cover mm. of um, with the clown suit. And she like wrote my name on it. She touched my belly because I was pregnant. Oh, my god! I have pictures with her. I also got to meet um, Lisa Zane, which was the daughter of Freddy Krueger in Part 6. I got <gasps> to talk to her. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I was in the same room as the T-1000 from Terminator. Like, they were all there. Oh, my god gosh and so like and oh, gee, sidebar you're courtney actually bumped into robert england in the bathroom what yes yeah, sidebar you guys i'm sorry but <laughs> and I, think I was crying in the parking lot because no. the whole reason we went was for me to meet robert england it was <laughs> like my birthday and we went to the line but we got there too late but you know it's all the way in cincinnati and mm -hmm. they closed the line before mm. we could like ask him meet him okay him. okay but he was like i'm sitting in the panel holding seats for this man he's like i'm gonna go to the bathroom <laughs> he comes back like looking i'm like what's wrong and he's like i, I bumped into freddie krueger <laughs> like, oh my gosh i was 
like, what did you say to him? And he was like, I mean, it's the bathroom. I didn't want to say anything. It's kind of weird. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> he was like, that's creepy. He's like, but I bumped into him. And I was, this is how I know it was no hormones. Because I started crying and then I was just enraged. So I was like, <laughs> you're not even the biggest fan as me. <laughs> Why do you get to do, why do you get the chance? What the hell? So I promise you, if I meet Matthew Lillard, I'm probably going to fall on the foot. I'm probably going to look like those chicks that take those pictures with Jason Momoa and Courtney's going to just stand to the side like. Yeah. But that, I mean, but it's. That's gonna be a, it's going to be a long ride home, but it'll be worth it. It'll be so worth it. I'm going all fangirl out. I'm going all fangirl out. Like, just, you might, you got, you only going to get this one chance to meet him. So you got to live, you got to do crazy it. Part is, I love him as like Stu. Like yes. I love him and Stu. Yes. But my favorite thing is him and Senseless. It's something about those piercings that he has. I don't yeah. know why. Yeah. For me, it's Thirteen Ghosts. I oh, love absolutely. him in Thirteen Ghosts. They're but Senseless, high. yeah, Senseless is oh, uh, he's oh, uh, I just love him. But yes, Thirteen Ghosts. Peak Matthew Willard, very hot. Yes. Very suave. Very not taking nobody shit. Yes. But also, I'm he happy. has like a goofy kind of aspect to him like he's funny like he's he I'm, not I'm only so will like that he didn't make it through that movie either i know I, I know i was like everybody else lived but this motherfucker that actually knew what was going on whatever right. anyway. oh back to screen, back to screen. <laughs> so they're stabbing each other and he cuts through and Sue's getting a little woozy yeah get a little woozy here <laughs> which thinking about that do you think that Billy meant to do that on purpose because he didn't want to to survive. Loki, yes. I do too. Loki, yes, because Billy, he ain't got nothing to lose at this point. Because no. in the in the moment, he's thinking, "Why do we got to be two survivors? It can only be me, nigga, because right. it's me. The story needs to be about me. My yeah. mom was the one that left. Like it's yeah. Because we all know Stu was gonna crack anyway, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> Stu was a loose cannon anyway so like let's come on like let's just be real Stu was a he loose was a cannon ghost. he was a loose end so you know the trash took out itself it's a, Stu's a snitch i'm sorry yep. he would have he snitched all yeah. day because he was he was happy to be a psychopath that's why he would have snitched on him because he would have been yes. <laughs> so he gets woozy and then Gail shows up with the gun, mm -hmm. and you're like, yeah, bitch, finally do something redeemable, but the bitch can't take the safety off, and Billy just knocks her out. Like, come on. Right, and in, in the midst of getting knocked out, Sydney has disappeared. Yep. She got the fuck out of there. <laughs> and Billy's like, you should have been right. I'm feeling a little woozy here. Yeah. <laughs> he tried. I mean, goddamn. Like, he was like. That man was so over it, he just sat down. Yeah. That was like. Like you on your own play, I'm gonna sit down. That's it. That's all he could do in the moment. That's all he, he could do in the out. moment. Like he he played that role damn good. Stu was a very pivotal character in the screen. Think we would have been as good without Stu. Hell no. Hell yeah. no. It it needed it needed Stu also gave us a little bit of that comic relief, but kind of sort of like he's funny. But he's also like a psychopath. Like he's crazy. No, let's, let's keep it real. Ninety nine point nine percent of girls who love screen movies are like horrible women with dark humor, and Stu gave that to us. He absolutely did. He did. He gave it to Laughing us on a silver platter. Like this is why we laugh <laughs> at shit yes. because of Stu. <laughs> so Billy's looking for Sydney. She calls him. And she's talking shit. Mm -hmm. she's like I've already called. Fuck she calls Billy. Billy puts the phone down and gives it to Stu. And Stu's like out of it. And he misses the phone. And he's like, did you really call the police? And she's like, yeah. And he's like, my parents are going to be so proud of me. <laughs> iconic. Like, this movie is just yeah. so iconic. Oh, my gosh. But when Billy, like, throws the phone down, and he's like, you hit me with the phone, Dick. Dick. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I will rewind that part like four times. <laughs> you have to at least. Like dang. And then when I watched I watched the video of him talking about how like he just made that up. And I'm like <laughs> That boy can act, man. I'll tell you, you know, that 
that point. Said, that Billy one, he said that Billy wants to say that, hey, skeet through the phone at me if he wasn't supposed to. And that was my natural reaction. That was. And that was mm, chef's kiss. Chef's kiss. Chef's kiss. Like, I'm glad that made the cut. That was yes, the cut. And my like, parents are going to be mad at me made the cut. But yes. When, when she's like, well, Billy has a motive. What's yours? And he's like, and he says it so straight mm -hmm. when he goes, peer pressure, I'm far too sensitive. <laughs> Oh my gosh, like yes. <laughs> like bruh, I feel it. Nineties. <coughs> that's that's the nineties for you. Like peer pressure was a motherfucker. Like what the hell? <laughs> yeah, like, I'm just I'm far too sensitive. <laughs> that's it. And it's simple. Straight <laughs> straight to the point. Stu has Stu was it's, always straight and to the point. He ain't gonna so, beat around the bush. None of that. It's just so funny because it's like, okay, so you murdered your ex girlfriend and you kidnapped a whole person, kept him in your basement. You raped a woman, but you're too sensitive to tell him no to the killing spree. Hey, peer pressure is a mug, ain't it? Peer oh, pressure is a mug. Pull that off. I don't know. <laughs> peer pressure, just hey. But seeing Sydney pop out the closet with the full ghost face outfit on and stab Billy with the umbrella. Yes, it was a. It was a. As a viewer, I felt vindicated in that moment. Look, as a woman, I was like, oh, you penetrated her and she gonna penetrate you. Yep. And how fucked up is that? That Sydney loses her goddamn virginity the same night and then she gotta kill this fool. Like <laughs> to the person that killed her mom. To the person and, that killed like and, the, and sexually assaulted her. So he said the both of them. I mean, theoretically speaking. He did. And that's and, and it's like, bruh, Sydney, like Sydney needed therapy after that. I'm saying you're talking about a a fucking reason for celibacy. I think that's number one. I mean, that is number one. Don't know, but that, that would have taught me right there. You should have kept. I should have kept my goodies to myself all day. And then Gail, you know, she comes to no, she stabs Billy. Stu comes to, and they have that tussle. Mm -hmm. And he's like, "I've always had a thing for you, Sid." <laughs> Another, and, another line that and oh. she, she fucks him up, she digs into him, and she throws the TV on him. And I don't care what nobody says, people survive electrocutions every day. B, yeah, he's still out there now. I will say, if it is canon that Stu is dead, he didn't die from the electrocution, he died from the blood loss, right? Right, yeah. And at the end of the day, if you're telling me you can de-age Skeet Ulrich and put him in as a memory, I want to see some Stu. I mean, why didn't we get a re reincarnation of Stu? It's like, it's like they like just write him out of shit. They it's do. Like, come on. They did Stu dirty because he was a pivotal role. They did the best friend dirty. She could have been a pivotal. Like That's what I don't understand. Like moving forward with the sequels, how come nobody talks about Stu? Because most of the murders happened at his house. So how do you just not talk about him? Right. And it would have made sense for Stu some sort of, they could have, I feel like they could have written if they were going to do this whole Billy Loomis has a, he had a daughter and all this shit. That that really just came out of nowhere. Poof. Okay, he got a he got a secret daughter. I feel like the writing could have had something to do with Stu as well. See, I something. knew that we were going the secret child route because that's what you do in a recall. Yeah, I I have my own theories about what, and we'll we'll get to that when we get to screen five. Yeah, I have my own theories about yeah. what's going on with Stu and what they did that's making me think Easter egg time. But we'll get there. Yep. Um, I'm gonna hold that one in the back pocket. We got it. We got <laughs> it. Yep. We gonna hold it. Um, we gonna hold that one. But yeah, Gail shoots Billy. Randy comes to, you, and you know he's like, you know, they always come back for that one good scare, and Sydney pops him between the eyes. Not in my movie. Yep. There we go. Boom. Dead. Dunzo. Yep. And we see that Dewey is still kicking. He's still kicking. So it's like, so even though we had some losses that was like, damn, they, why they have to go, we we still have some some pivotal characters that is like, oh, yeah. okay, they made it. They yeah. made it. I mean, of course, I love that Randy made it because Randy's us, right? Like, Randy's the viewer. So yes. I love the fact that we survived the movie with them. Yes. 
I always I I love Dewey. I love Dewey after one. I don't love Dewey in one. Mm-hmm. If we were going just off of who should have survived just this first one, Dewey should have died. Yeah, if Dewey would have died, I don't think like we weren't sad. We weren't no. sad at the at the thought that he died. Not in the first one. Not in the first one. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, he's still alive. That's cute. You know what I'm saying? So I, it was I like, didn't, okay. I, I didn't get attached to Dewey until part two. Yeah, yeah. Dewey proved yeah. himself a lot in part two. And I'm Dewey I'm gonna be excited. Real, I'm gonna be excited to talk about two. Real, yeah, because Dewey got real slick mouth with Gail after she wrote that book. He, he did, did not like what she said about him. He did, as he fucking should have. But not checked. happy about her. Yes. About him. Checked her. Mm-hmm. Quickly. So. And part two <laughs> gives us our, our first introduction into black people in the screen. Like, Finally. Yeah. I'm glad we talked about that. Because that was a, something that was kind of on my heart today. And I was like, there literally was no black people in now, this the screen. Is, this is the thing, though, why I was like, Oh, we're gonna get some black people eventually. I even knew this as a kid because Wes Craven loves black people. Mm-hmm. We know this. Mm-hmm. Okay, if you watch the people under the stairs. Oh yeah, classic. With the classic Ding Rain. Classic. You no, know for a fact. He loves he us. Loves black people. He loves us. He the does. serpent. Have you ever seen the serpent in the rainbow? Mm-mm. That is okay. We're gonna talk about this movie at some point, but that is a Wes Craven film that I feel like you need to see. The Serpent in the Rainbow is about. Uh, people in Haiti practicing like voodoo mm. and there's so many stories that Wes has told about like that shit being real Okay, and the shit that happened to the crew over there but I think it, it's a great movie it's about this guy he goes over there he wants to learn about these practices he's writing a story about it and they do some shit to him and that's all I can tell you Okay, it's such a good Wes Craven movie and the fact that he really paid like respect to like the Haitian people like he paid them okay you know he didn't you know how like when white people you know do like voodoo or santeria or hoodoo or whatever yeah it's from like a comical standpoint right he filmed it and wrote it in a way that is very respectful okay okay I'm about to check so out I'm about I, to look I into think that. you would enjoy it okay yeah I'm gonna look into that I'm, I'm into that. I love the stuff. Though. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's called the Serpent and the Rainbow. West has some bangers. So West is always like black people. Mm-hmm. And when we get to scream too, I am so excited because we get to deal with Hallie and Joel. Yes. Who then later on got on all of us together. That's another yes. little head cannon. Yes. <laughs> yes. I like to I like to think that Hallie survived and then her and Joel ran off and like started a life together and then they had all of us. That's it. It was, they just had, they had a different life. They wanted to get away from that trauma shit because they wasn't with that white people shit, you know? Right. It was gay. They got the hell out of there. Like, well, let's get. If, you, if you, you really think about it, right? Like, Hallie could have went on and became a teacher like she did. Yep. And Joel was already in the news game as yep. a cameraman. Right. And then he became a sportscaster. It, it all makes sense. sense. It, the story arc makes sense. It makes yes, perfect I've sense. I've already connected the threads. I'm not yep. taking no for an answer. Yep. Yep. That's it. That's how it happened. So, final thoughts on screen how do you feel this movie cemented itself to be respected by everybody by the industry by just the genre in itself how do you feel what do you feel like the impact that screen made on on the whole film I industry feel like introducing meta and comedy into horror was something that wasn't done very well mm-hmm in the 80s, mm-hmm. in the early 90s, mm-hmm. and Wes and Kevin Williamson nailed it in a way that it became a blueprint on how to do a horror comedy. Yes. Right. Yes, absolutely. Because people would try to do humor and it was miserable. So yes. in fact, they made it work and they actually like, you know, when they make these movies and they try to use like the slang of the time, they didn't do that. So it, it's timeless because there's no, the only outside of the clothes and the music and the technology, yeah. if you took those <clears> things <throat> away, it's a pretty time. Nobody's using slang. Nobody. Right dating themselves right right right. uh you have a killer that easily could be anybody that's what cemented it we didn't have a a fixture that was supernatural or was traumatized abused Mm -hmm. it was just a regular person in a 20 dollar costume yep that just didn't care about anybody yep yep that is terrifying yep and this movie even though it had its comedic elements it still was very very terrifying it was very scary 
yeah, it brought a sense of realism to mm-hmm. the genre that hadn't been seen. Because everything had been, you know, Chucky doll, Jason, but yep. all supernatural things, right? right. So the, yep. the realism. And the last time that we really had realism like that was with Halloween. That was it. And right. even so, then, by by that time, because Halloween, the franchise started in the 70s, oh yeah. by oh the yeah. 90s, right. this was, you know, it, it had been done so many times where yeah. Michael Myers is now this A larger zombie. than life, you know, entity. Yeah, by- by this time, we had gotten into the whole he was a part of the cult of thorn thing. So it, it had already went off. It spawned. Way. Yep. It spawned into something so, so different. And Scream was a breath of fresh air to yes. horror. Like it, it, re, it, it put air back into horror, the genre. Yes, it made it people want to go to the movies. It made people want to talk about it. Extremely relatable characters. Absolutely. Because high school. Niggas in high yeah. school, like we know somebody like Randy. We know somebody like Stu. We know a couple like <laughs> like Sydney and Billy. Like we know these people. We know these and characters. Every, every trailer news squad has a Tatum. Yes. Like, yes. So and every Tatum has a big brother. Mm-hmm. Like it it was so yep. it's such relatable content. Yes. And that's what and makes it I timeless. That. That's what makes it timeless in itself because it those characters could could be people that we know and then the whole movie is just done in a way where we don't know who did it as soon as we point right. the finger at somebody that it's was like the other thing no. that i was gonna say it revitalized the who done it yes absolutely which is right. always which even when a who done it per first came on the scene that shit fucked niggas up because it's yeah. getting I like movies that get the get the viewer involved. Like it makes us feel like we're a part of it. Who we're trying to guess who it is the whole time, and then when we find mm-hmm. out at the end, we kind of knew. You know the the signs were there, all there in our and face. That's what I'm saying. Like the who do, the reason why Scream survived as a franchise isn't because they're great, isn't because the writing has been solid for five just over twenty years, it's mm-hmm. not because Ghostface is such. An amazing character because Ghostface changes every movie. Every it's movie because you want to know who done it and you want to know if you can figure it out before you leave. Yes, and they throw us for a loop almost every time. almost every time. Well, I can't say yeah, I can't say every time. Even I that fourth one. When we get into part two, mm-hmm. that is when you're going to really see my love for it because I and I will die on this hill and people. Have argued with me in so many comments. Yes, Stu and Billy were OG, but the best fucking plot twist of Scream is Scream 2. Yes. Best plot twist. And we will get into that when we talk about Scream 2. Yes, we absolutely will. I am so excited that this is happening. Okay. Yes. We have we we have we have this going. So this is is going to conclude our very first episode of our horror deep dives so moving forward any um any last things you want to share with our listeners about up and coming you know deep dives that we're going to do because like i said we're going to discuss we're going to be this we're leading up to the big one we're leading up to screen six that is going to be released March, what, March 10th? 10th. March 10th. Um, I just saw the actual like trailer for it, and it looks like I'm I'm my expectations are so high. So you saw the teaser? Yes. We're get we're getting a trailer in three days on the 19th. Okay, yeah. I saw the teaser. So yeah. yeah. My just from the viewing of that that little teaser, my expectations are high. They're through the roof. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wondering how they're going to, what, what story are they going to give us? I'm, I want to go into it with an open mind, but my expectations are high because I still need them to not stray too far away from the who done it. You know what? Here's the thing. I like, I like five after like my second watching. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have high expectations just how I am now with remake. Mm-hmm. I just don't. Ever since the Nightmare on Elm Street remake broke my heart, I just don't have expectations of remake. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they're going in the direction that I've been, you know, I follow all the blogs, like I'm on this. Yeah. If 
they're going the direction that people are saying that they're going. They have screened it already. Mm -hmm. I'm cool with it. I just want to know how they're going to wrap up the trilogy because everybody knows that part three is where you fuck up. Yeah. Unless you're Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. Nightmare yeah. on Elm Street is literally the only franchise where part three is the best part. Yeah. Yeah. We shall Friday see. Friday 13, part three, 3D, terrible. Halloween, Season of the Witch, mm-mm. Wasn't Child's it? Play 3, forgettable. Yeah. Like, yeah. Saw 3, we got off the train. Like, there's not a franchise that gets to part three and it's solid, except for Nightmare on Elm Street. So if they can nail this. Yeah. We'll the radio silence is going down in fucking history of reviving not only a, an amazing franchise, but a Wes Craven franchise. Yeah. Which is unheard of. No one has been able to master that man's feeling, yeah. his direction, or his hint. Yeah. So if they can nail part three, that's that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. It's, it's Scream 7. We have a Scream 7. Yeah. Can you stick the landing? Can if you? not, then it's yeah. Halloween ends all over again. I'm still traumatized. Yeah. Yeah, um, I I need I need them to bring it. I just need them to bring it. Thank you.